Am, am I right? Because I am, my memory is telling me that at one point the province actually invited municipalities to come forward with ideas on how to make the green belt bigger. Are there are there parts of your community, local mm -hmm. government? that should be included in the Green Belt. And I believe some of those municipalities did come forward with some suggestions. Well, in this, in this current round of Green Belting, if I can put it that way, we've gone out and we've met with those councils. And they've all passed resolutions. Many of them have said, we don't need to expand the Green Belt in our community. We have enough protection policies with water and natural features that we don't need the Green Belt. Um, so it will be interesting to see if the government will take the time to talk to their partners and really understand what their partners are saying. Um, or whether or not this government looks at it as a political opportunity, regardless of what their partners are saying. And, that's, and these are all things that we work with in the public space. So I say this with confidence because if you look at council resolutions from Simcoe and other places, they're very clear. We don't need a green belt to protect our water features. We're going to do it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we'll see exactly what the government wants to do with that conversation. But it's interesting to hear partners, municipal partners, regional partners, talking to the provincial government and laying those things out in a public way, and watching to see how the government responds. So, and, and just to reiterate what you said a couple of minutes ago then, you believe, the Home Builders Association believes that if there's a process that is based in science and evidence and technical Absolutely. information, you're okay with that because we're, it should yield a good outcome. We are, we've been publicly in this space for a long time, that we're not here to fight the green belt. Um, we believe that there's value to it, it needs to be protected, it's part of the structure and will be for moving on forever in Ontario. The real question becomes, if we're going to expand it, what are the principles around that? If it's scientifically based, natural heritage features, water features, mm -hmm. we are going to be contributing to that conversation with evidence and information, and we should be protecting those features. All right, fair enough. So I guess the challenge is, when we have a province, I think the stats are that 100,000 people a year are arriving from outside of Canada into Ontario, primarily southern Ontario. And I was at an Ontario Chamber of Commerce event recently where they told us uh, in attendance that uh, Ontario is now realizing 30,000 people a year uh, net in migration That's right. from other parts of Canada. That's right. So a lot of people arriving every day that need somewhere to live. Right. And obviously your members are in the business of providing that obviously. kind of housing. Uh, so really what you, what you need is an environment where government will work with you to enable that as opposed to setting up a lot of barriers to make it harder and, and, and more expensive. I think I saw something the other day that something like 25%, like some big number mm -hmm. of the cost inputs into a new home are government fees and levies and so on and so forth. So you're looking for a change in the, in the approach. You're looking for governments to work with you as a partner but uh, what, so your members can do what they do. Well, it's interesting you, you, you say it this way because we often get stuck in these demand conversations. Where are these people coming from? Are there real people looking for real homes? And the data keeps showing us, yes, there are real people coming to GTA, which is a really big pressure point. Right. They're really coming here because there is a prosperity opportunity here. Employment is good. Jobs are real. There's opportunity. So we're, we're drawing people into this region, 100,000 plus. Um, so the demand is real. And so now the question is, how is the supply side responding to that demand? And, and I often have to remind all levels of government it's only the builders building housing. I mean, the federal government has now injected itself, but the, the housing that they're building is very specific to a very specific band of people. Um, and so when it comes to middle-class families looking for housing, they're coming to building centers. And so the supply that's available there is market-driven, but members can only build where, when, and what government approves. So they're partners in this. Um, so when the government takes an approach that's more political than evidence-based, and that's what we're seeing in the last year. Um, the challenge then becomes, well, how do we respond? We have, you know, as people always say, we have applications in process that have been sitting four, five, six years. And so you can't get to an endpoint because not only do you have to get the approval, but then you have to get the infrastructure in place, and that requires an approval. So you end up in a strange place where someone will point to a map and say, well, that's been designated for growth for 15 years. Why haven't you started building it? And you have to go back to them and say, well, there's no pipe in the ground because the approval to get that pipe is sitting in the Minister of the Environment's office. Until we get that approval, it's just a color on a map. Right. We can't actually get to selling and building. So I can't live somewhere if there's no water coming in and no sewers taking water away. Right? And this is, this is the challenge that we have when we get into the more complicated piece right. of it. But 
demand is real. We all recognize that, even to the point where, you know, speaking with the current government, they've identified they have supply issues. I mean, just recently they announced that they're going to come together and do a land deal, a land lease with private development to bring more rental to the marketplace because there is a supply issue. We're all struggling to get supply to the marketplace. So they've had to take a sort of an active step in this, and we welcome that. That's a great way of leveraging their lands to bring supply to the marketplace. But that's only going to cover off a small piece. At the end of the day, it's only the builders across Ontario. I mean, we see supply pressures in places like London now, mm-hmm. where people are making the move from the GTA, if their jobs are mobile enough, into the London marketplace. That's changed that marketplace significantly. They're struggling now with the next level of supply. So what you're starting to see is this migration out. Hamilton's another great example. CMHC talks about Hamilton and how much growth has been driven into Hamilton. It's a reflection of people who are looking for housing choice in the GTA, can't find it, drive down the QEW, what's available? Now we're seeing that Hamilton pressure move into Niagara. So there's an effect here where we can't get our approvals and our housing supply to market in the GTA. In the communities where people want to live, then they say, okay, where's my, what's my next option? And people will drive to qualify. That's a reality. Um, so as we squeeze people, they're making a decision. Am I comfortable moving into townhouses, mid-rise, and condos? Or do I still want a single-family home with a backyard? And if I still want that, what do I need to do? If I need to drive down the road 50 kilometers to find that, I'll find it. And I will find a way to make everything else work.